such a big opportunity. He thinks I live there in the English direction. Uh, yes, I think I can wherever I am. Um, and yeah, same his contributions and contributions of the day and night. So he's supposed to be like one of the same. Like, but like, I mean, there are various compartmentalizations in your life in Peru. Uh, your private life, your public life, your, uh, you know, what you do, what you do and look like during the day, what you do and look like at night are two very different things. And they're probably, they're probably different in a lot of places around the world, but uh, maybe the way it's more pronounced. Uh, so I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it, it seeps into everything. Uh, so I, sorry, yeah, very really sorry. Can you please speak to the mic so everybody can hear you? Sorry, sorry. Oh, thank you. It's like Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the great things about this panel is that we've got a novelist here, and we've got sort of journalists and media man and commentator, and we've got poets, so they're different genres that we're really looking at. And uh, I'm curious now, for you generally, this is your work, I know that it's changed from collection to collection over the years, but if you could elaborate or maybe ask the question, how does it really inspire you? Um, I think, generally speaking, I am inspired by urban spaces in general. Cities uh, inspire me. There's one line in the book that is not about Beirut is, Lives upon lives upon lives, and then when I do sort of roam cities, I am like a child. Seriously, I'm always sort of like, wow, there are all these people existing at this, you know, in this space, like vertically, horizontally, you know. So I think the urban fascinates me, and I think Beirut inspired me first and foremost as a Tripoli girl. Because I didn't grow up in Beirut, I grew up in Tripoli, Lebanon, and I moved to Beirut when I was 18. And so I was like, it was the city, right? I was like moving to the city. And um, so it was the place where I could be more independent and do whatever the hell I wanted. And yes, drink and dance and, and you know, be more sexually liberated, whatever. But also, also it was in the space where I made friends who liked to talk about what I liked to talk about, where there was like this literary space and you know where we just drank insane amounts of coffee and roamed the streets reading poetry or you know. So it will always be that to me. And that was what initiated my first book. Um, and the first book is dedicated to my neighborhood the my there for purpose because it is my neighborhood, it's how I experience neighborhoods, and I realize that there are different neighborhoods for different people. And, and so that was sort of the, how to live it off of my first book, which is all about neighborhoods, inspired by neighborhoods. A book, it's a book of love poems in the city, really, I think, uh, came from. Um, and even through the course of writing to the content, my relationship with Beirut was already changing. There was like the nostalgia poems, uh, most of uh, which I threw out because they were like, oh, this thing, like it doesn't make any sense, right? And then there was the post nostalgia poems, where I was like, no, let's just really remember the city. And what I also discovered, um, maybe you guys can elaborate on that as well, is that in remembering space, I was always remembering it, I was always reinventing it. Uh, and that's why Beirut is, is, is constantly changing. And I think Beirut as a city refuses to be pinned down. Uh, I don't think that I would ever, as a writer, write about Beirut in certainty. I always write about it in doubt. I go from doubt to doubt from question to question. It refuses to be pinned down. In some sense, it is the more perfect goal. Because it refuses to be pinned down, and that's how it continues to to inspire me. Right, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's a city as we were also full of contradictions, and partially for that reason, uh, it's often depicted in the press as being sort of this exoticized place. Uh, as Leslie said, this is a theme that we're very familiar with, as well as these and not these. It can be cringeworthy sometimes. But other points, 
really should kind of take a step back and think about the truths of some of the stereotypes or the way people in some size do. And that's what I'm kind of want to ask you guys next. Do you feel like you've challenged any of those ideas in your work? Have you asked to be attempted to challenge those ideas or have you maybe that seep into your work in some way? Um, I mean, I, um, I think it's hard because it's, 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 all, it's very hard to also avoid cliché sometimes for the city as uh, contradictory to me. I remember um, I, I, I was doing, uh, I did my, my dissertation on uh, the 2006 war between Israel and, and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, Lebanon, and I uh, spent the summer, I think it was 2007, taking photographs of all the bombed out uh, areas in Beirut in, in uh, the Dahi summers, which were the most hard hit. And I posted some on Facebook, and a Lebanese friend of mine got really angry with me. He said, Why are you showing them? Why are you showing the world the bombed out parts of, of Beirut? Why aren't you showing them the great nightlife that yeah. Beirut has? And so there's always this contradiction. If you, when you want to talk about the great nightlife, someone's always there to tell you, but you know, there's, there's all this poverty and there's all this uh, corruption, etc., etc. And then when you want to talk about the poverty and corruption, someone's always there to tell you, you know, there's a great nightlife, have fun. Yeah. Uh, so I think for me, the, the struggle in writing about a city like Beirut is, is how do you do that in a way that, that kind of uh, blends these, these two dimensions together and understands them in relation to one another. Because I feel like I can't really describe how uh, you know the beauty of seeing you know um, young boys you know belly dancing on huge speakers uh, with just this fire. In them. I can't describe how mesmerizing that is without also showing you you know the fact that when these boys turn on the taps, salt water comes out, right? Like those those two things to me are are intricately connected. So as a writer, I feel. To, to show that multi-dimensionality of it. And there's a moment when you tell them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay. I mean, the thing is, we uh, self concept in a lot of cases. So we, I mean, I mean, so the Ministry of Tourism puts out videos about how great the nightlife is. You know, you go if you fly to Beirut and you're on the East Airlines, there's this incessant video for 20 minutes that just shows people dancing in the beach. So yeah, that's that's the message we're putting out. So, I mean, we can't blame the New York Times journalist who's there for two days and goes, eh, ah, it's part of the time. Yeah, that's what we're telling you is. So, you know, if you went to the places we told you to go to, then this article is what happened. Um, but but, but uh, we can't blame them for the truth. Can I? Can I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because, uh, uh, I mean, I'm not a journalist, I'm a poet, so I react to the world differently. But if I were a journalist, I would take extra time. To find out more and research more, and not just like rely on the Ministry of Tourism. Of course, you know, can I counter this? Like, if I'm, I look at every article on Elizabeth, I look at every article on Elizabeth, it lists the same five places. I wonder if I'm lying, because everyone in Elizabeth who I'm not just fucking tour, like these yeah. journalists from here, it's all the in Elizabeth. I wonder, maybe, I don't know if there's some Portuguese, because I don't know. But like, uh, like, you seem to attach this importance. Like there's a kind of personal injury involved in the, the fact that uh, we're not taking things being taken seriously enough, or we, we appreciate that we have layers that maybe someone isn't seeing. But it, it's a lot to expect from my my problem with, with that kind of reporting, and not you know not all the articles are bad. But my problem with bad articles usually lies into the um, confidence of these articles, not not, not in the fact. That this writer went to the clubs and saw the clubs and he's the city. He, it's, all, it's always a human. And he is describing uh, the, the city with a sheep that he has conquered. <laughs> uh, uh, so my problem isn't with that. My problem is with how the art, how the writing is made. So if, if that reporter were to tell me, this is what I get in Beirut. There, there are other things, but this is what I did. And not to be so sure of himself, like, this is where you need to go when you go to get with it. This is what Beirut is about. Have I lived in it seven years, I lived in it, I still don't know what Beirut is about. So there has to be some space for doubt, again. 
my, my problem with that kind of reporting is when you're so sure of yourself that I've got this, I figured out this city. That's, that's the only problem. I don't have a problem with them going to the club and joining us and writing about them. Just the, the nuance, like have a little bit more nuance. So, yeah. Zena, I mean, obviously, you, as we said, you understand this and you interpret the world quite differently because you're a photo, but if you can kind of take a step back on it, do you address in any, in any way besides like the way that you do your work? Um, not in my first book. In my first book, I was sort of, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a different book than I'm over now. I'm over it now. But yes, in my second book, uh, the second book, Love and Heart is dedicated to our broken languages and our broken cities, and it's not at all about Beirut. But there's this one poem called Khanda that does precisely that. Which you think we can be one. So, just a little bit of context about Khanda That poem had a mind, a mind of its own. I, I started this poem, I started writing this poem thinking I was going to write a poem about Khanda and they would sort of used to divide uh, the war in Beirut, right? But then it, it completely changed its mind and it became this long six page, I'm not going to read six pages to you, just an answer. A long six page poem and dialogue between a woman and a man. And the woman is obviously Arab and older than the man. And the man is, she says, somewhere west, too cute, too pale. She tells him, and um, uh, they're in a love relationship. And the man is is younger, and you can tell that he's eager to know about this like Arab woman, like tell me about you. And she's sort of tired, but she too, like the Ministry of Tourism, engages in that relationship. It's not so it's not a black and white thing in that home. So she does love him. She does sleep with him. She does speak to him, and and, and so it's, it's kind of like a complicated. Thing. Uh, you get it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so um, I'm not going to say and now she speaks and now he speaks. It's I think you guys can figure it out. But I'll say that she begins the dialogue and I'll read the next one. So this is oh, and Khanda, for those of you who don't know what Khanda means, uh, is uh, trench. It's trench. So Khanda, of course, after the grass in Russian, I'm going to work also. So this is her, she begins. But what I really want is to love you, kill you, on this trench of a street, a broken window, dark green shutters overlooking that shell of a church, the ghost of thieves, of publishing houses, of writers walking with their manuscripts in their arms. No forgetting here, only making coffee and love about the sounds of motorcycles and slogans for religions that tear at each other with nails in heaven. Think about that when your body longs for my bare back, my long legs, my laughter. Here, everything has been stolen, killed, or survives. There are no stairs in that building, and I am watching from the last floor where the mosaics on the ground remain untouched. Touch me. I have learned the words Habibi and Allah, and now you are both. I worship you to the point of wanting to devour your memories. I want to see the little girl in your sleep carries a blanket and walks this city. I want this schizophrenic city of yours. I don't sleep. You say the only thing you know is how to destroy men. I am not scared. You scare me. I want the smell of the alleys that inhabit you. Is it blood you want? Is it my fingers on your walls between your legs? You say telling is only sweeter and untrue. Touch me, then, with your memories, your fingernails, with whatever lives inside those dark tunnel eyes of yours. The ceiling is leaking. Draw the goddamn camera. 
You are always shocked at how things don't work here. I left my husband long before I told him I would, kept asking him to sleep with me every night. Every night it was like digging to make love and love and love as if the sun is buried underneath it all. And then to look up and find yourself standing in your own grave. The ceiling is leaking. I left my husband. He was too Arab for me. For God's sake, get a bucket, a towel, drop the goddamn camera. You are not Arab enough for me. And they go on and on. Um, could you maybe tell us a little bit about how you felt about being a little bit Do you remember when you were today? When it came to your mind, this is about you. Because the poem began as the first stanza of the poem, which is her speaking, which ends with where the mosaics on the floor remain untouched. And that was where I thought the poem ended, and that it was a poem about Hannah to me, and that's it. But then there was this other voice in my head replying to this woman, like her lover. And then it, like, I was like, sort of really haunted by these two characters in my head. Uh, in the some like not forsaken corner of the you know, talking about the city and making love and, and sort of, and you know, I, I just I don't know, know where it came from exactly, but I do think that this particular book focuses a lot on language and that that came from that as well. The many languages that we speak in the and the many languages that we inhabit. So, yeah, sure. Um, just to come back to you, I was a little bit surprised by it. Say about the quarter, if you don't have, you feel like maybe it's unfair to them to be That's a wonderful thing. You have, because I feel like it's really used to actually be quite critical of that approach. You're quite piercing in your commentary, you're quite satirical as well. Could you maybe elaborate on why that has changed? If I'm wrong, you know, I feel like it's wrong. No, I mean, I come at it from the same perspective, both of you know, it's. Like those of the ages ago on CNN, uh, Richard Weiss, he shouts a lot, he's very shouting. Uh, so he was in the uh, piece, and it just uh, made my stomach turn. It was really, because it wasn't complex, it wasn't, there was no, he was here for a he was there for a while, he was there for He could have had a more complex piece than everything's fine, it wasn't these rooftop clubs. Uh, and, but, you know, I mean, it's just, I, I know more journalists now, I know they have a tough time when they go to the city. I, I just, it's, it's empathy with the people trying to come. Obviously, sometimes when it's in GQ and someone's obviously out to like, write a really bad piece, like, that's the, not the right for GQ sometimes. So it's not like I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm saying sometimes we did with a very small budget, we said go for a day. So it's, it's more technical than I, and again, it's just a bit of more empathy with the But what I do, I mean, what I, what I I think is a shame that no one has ever addressed is, for example, why do we have rooftop clubs? Like the reason, like, no one's famous for these rooftops. And uh, rooftops emerged, like, in this, like, mid 2000s, when we had all car bombs. And so people felt comfortable on the roof of buildings rather than being street level, because it was less dangerous. So people would say, oh, I want to be a privileged few who go to somewhere else, that one of these places would say, Oh, good, there's a security guy in the land and park, parking really far from the street. Uh, and then it became this thing that now we're just associated with, oh, it's fun, and then people forget the origin. And the other reason is, like, why, why is no one looking for the reason why everyone that wants us to be drunk on, again, a lot of one that's very conservative uh, spaces, but in my environment, everyone wants us to be drunk all the time. I was drunk all the time. Uh, and I wonder. Nice people here, people even say they go around a few years and then you know, they go home. But I see there's like a level of, you know, I don't want to, it's like you know, psychology 101, but like, I mean, I think it's, there seems to be some kind of self medication going on. Like, I'd love someone to write something about that to like explain to me. Um, so I guess I don't hate these also I think I just wish we could do a better job on the other side to say, like, okay, why is this person part of this? Like, why? Why is everyone on drugs and drinking so much and what we really matter for the future? Yeah. Um, like this is one of the things, like one of the things I do hate is when people call it one of the No, it's not one of the it's uh, like self-destruction. It's something very different, uh, kind of insidious, 
model is, and it's even if we go, I still go out. And for example, I have another one coming here. And the second I went through, I thought, oh, good, good luck, which is, I kind of feel silly now, but like, uh, like I was saying earlier, so like, the two notes were there, like, I think 21 plus, like, how old are you? I was like 35, she's like, oh, I can still go out, that's cool. Uh, but, um, so, so I'm mean, going to time this model. But, like, so, but when I think about the guy, there is a part of this, and around the edges of the spaces, that it's not all fun. Like, there's something we're trying to exercise, like, there's something going on that it's not all fun games. It's obviously fun games if you come for a week and you see it visually, and you're like, oh yeah, this is amazing. Like, wow, you know, people are uh, really up for it. But then, spend the time, you talk, if you live there, if you you understand that there's something a bit. Do you think there, there might also be a lack of nuance even in that approach in the sense that you know, just people who are partying and drunk are drunk in particular in society, sorry about that. They're a particular society in a way not necessarily representative of the majority of people, hence by focusing and narrowing on that group, you are giving justice to the city as a whole. But I mean, of course, like, there's the uh, the places that I get to talk about in the press are uh, open to very few people uh, they want to take. I saw a ridiculous advice video once about how uh, uh, they have, I'm sorry, it's really very specific. But thanks on the beach, which is very specific, and club dining, like how that's like bringing, you know, fighting ISIS through quite a It was a very you know, convoluted piece of yeah, there's like a thousand people in this thing. This is not like a nationwide. Uh, it's just a thing that's going to classify a fun time. Uh, but, but I think it's correct. I, I don't think it's like, like night. when we say after class, I say that we think we're, we're talking about, uh, I don't think we're just talking about clock. We're even talking about just guys sitting by the side of the road with a shisha on, chatting all night, uh, often also on substances. Uh, we're talking about people in neighborhood bars also getting drunk on that bootleg liquor, which I have tried a couple times and I would not recommend, uh, like the hard competition. But I just thought I wanted to discuss about the AHA, which is like a, it's like a drive through drive through liquor. I was not driving, but um, people do drive through and they will get you to your drink to your car. It's all taxi drivers and so uh, these drivers and bus drivers. Really drunk all night there. I mean, so it's, I don't think it's like obviously the things we hear about the most are open to the rich few, but I think the phenomenon of unleashing a night is, is not uh, is not constrained to a certain socioeconomic group. I think life is tough on everyone in the group, and it's extremely tough on you if you're poor, and a lot of people are poor. I think the statistics are interesting. Half the population is living on the quality of life, like here. And even if you're middle class, life is tough. Like you said, you know, go for the time, some kind of brown crop comes out of the class, and the electricity is out half the time, and uh, it's expensive to put your kids through school. And, you know, so, like, challenges are there for everyone at every level, and I think the uh, compulsion to, to get out somehow is also kind of. Um, so we're all of the Lebanese descent, but we happen to not live um, in Lebanon. Um, um, many of us have, you know, we don't go away here to move to Lebanon, how I assume it's all to move. Um, I feel like maybe we should address this, because we are discussing food from this citizens in the UK, um, us in the UK, both here in London. Uh, I want to kind of ask you how you think your nostalgia for Beirut may have changed over the years. I know for me that I used to feel a lot more nostalgic about Beirut when I first left it many years ago. And I, I kind of approach Beirut with sort of a heavy heart now. Um, every time you go back, it becomes more and more difficult to me. You go back for, for various reasons, partially the political reasons, but also for personal reasons. And I'm wondering how you feel about that and if it's reflected in your, in your work at all. So you maybe you can come close. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm only partly on these, um, and, and even then it's, it's a bit contested because actually I'm originally Palestinian, uh, which is, adds a whole other dimension to my relationship to Lebanon. Um, yeah, but I mean, I think, I think what 
you say is absolutely true. There's like, you know, Beirut is as much a city that exists in reality as it does in the imagination, especially when you consider, you know, there's like 8 million living in the diaspora uh, who are uh, of Lebanese origin. For me, it was, it was funny because I, my father grew up in Beirut and he left during the Civil War. Um, and I, I just remember as a child, before having visited Beirut, just hearing my father speak about how wonderful Beirut was talking about skiing and talking about the parties and the beaches and all of these things. And I remember the first time we went, which was pretty soon after the Civil War, and that Beirut was in ruins. Um, and we, we, spent the, we started spending our summers in, in Beirut in my great aunt's torn down apartment in Asmi. Uh, and it, I mean, it was, it was so fascinating to me because I was, I, I was thinking about how my father was describing the city, and then I was looking at the reality, which is, you know, dead rats on the street, um, you know, we were living in a, an apartment where there were bullet holes in all of the furniture. It, it was just so completely out of sync with what my father was talking about. And, and I think it's the same now, you know, that I spent some time in um, you know, between uh, 2005 and 2010. Uh, and my, my, my image of Beirut has also been changed because now looking back that period is actually quite positive, especially yeah. compared to now. Yeah. Can I just say something? Wait, no, I want to finish. Yeah, sorry. Uh, and, and I remember, and, and um, last, uh, in earlier this year, I was at an event and there was an American guy who came up to me and said uh, how wonderful Beirut is and how, you know, how much fun it is. And I remember saying, well, it's not as like it used to be. There's a lot of problems now. You know, I was saying there's electricity problems, there's water problems, there's trash problems, and he was saying, well, you know, that's the charm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't. <laughs> no, when you, when you actually yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Not, it's not charm. Yeah. Um, yeah, sorry. And do you think that the way you feel about things now versus then will inform your work in any way going forward in your next project? Do you think about you? Uh, no, I'm not thinking. Why, why are you talking about it? Um, I don't know. I, I'm thinking about Iraq. My other half is Iraqi. And uh, so I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm exploring very similar themes around memory, which is all the stuff that we're talking about now. But I'm just, I'm, yeah, I'm looking at it through the lens of Iraq. How, Sam, I think you want to answer this question on the south end. But, I mean, I, I really identify with what Sally said, which is we have an idea of Beirut that, that, that keeps failing us uh, every single time we go back uh, to, to Beirut. I, I do think that, I would like to think that I, I am no longer a statue for Beirut, but I'd be lying to myself. I think I have an incurable case of, of Beirut to nostalgia. Uh, uh, but, but I don't do that in my writing. I'm talking as a person, but no longer in my writing. No, but I'm post Beirut nostalgic in my writing. And, <laughs> and so, but even in my first book, which was about Beirut, like I said, there were nostalgic moments and there post nostalgic moments. There were, you mentioned 2005 and 2010, in my hand, it was pre 2005 and post 2005, because I didn't think. 2006. And so pre-2005, it might have been naive on my part. Yeah, I was like, oh, was it, I wasn't even aware like there might be a car bomb. And then post-2005, so post the previous assassination, we were suddenly aware that, oh my god, there could be car bombs uh, anywhere. So the relation of dynamics, the relationship of you with know, the city changed. And then after that, I think there's like a, a pre-Syrian war and post-Syrian war. They would because when I go back to Hanau, which is like where I lived, you know, most of my time in they would and I'm like I have this image of me walking down Hanau, right? And I walk down Hanau and I'm completely shattered and how hard I'm going about how on every street corner there's a Syrian refugee family just laying there. And so we have this idea of Beirut in our heads and Beirut constantly keeps changing on us and we there's like a little girl in either because how dare you? But but it's, it's true, it's, Beirut is an idea, and it's, it's weird that I was with my friend in New York uh, a year ago, and we were walking down East Houston, and I was like, Huda, Huda, because Huda is my friend that I spent most of my Beirut years with, 
And I'm like, isn't this like your name? Isn't this like your name? And she goes, no, no, you're a little crazy. It's nothing like that. Okay, but in my head, I think it's because I was with that person that I had spent all these years in Beirut with that I wanted to even in those days on New York, you know? So it's, it's complicated. <laughs> and then a lot of the parts of that you have Touch on Beirut last year. Yeah. How about in the future? Do you want to go back to Beirut? <laughs> no, I, I think I, I have no clue what I'm doing. This book is very, very new. So I really don't, don't have any plans about what I'm doing in the future. But what I have been doing to editors now is I've been messing with their heads because editors usually come to me and say, oh, we like the political poetry right now. Please send us a poem. I say, yeah, sure, it's a lot of poem. <laughs> so I, I don't want like, to mess with their heads and like, not only be. The one who writes about like Arab cities or that. Well, I'm happy to do this. They do occupy a lot of my thoughts. But no, I don't think I will be going. I think I will be going back to like, I think it's like a spiral, you know, that we keep going back to our obsessions differently, but we do other things as well. And I have no clue what I'm doing next. And how about you, Nasi? You wanted to say something. Sorry, I'm not saying this. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's just the very very weird way that like, in the mid 90s, the sport Beirut was also my favorite Beirut. It's a very, very bad saying because it was a misery, you know, it was like, it was a result of a lot of misery. But I, I think it's because maybe it's the first Beirut for you. It's that, especially compared to like London, it's just completely liberating to be so, like, you know, care about like, don't talk to strangers, be careful how long you're about them. You know? and, and there it's just like, because they still had this notion of like small town old man, it's no one doesn't discover, and I would walk around. And it just it was like the first time I felt free, I guess. And, and I associated to this what we've like as an elite done, you know, a very hard job that didn't destroy all the traces of the war, no organization, no nothing. And just one, you know, the shiny buildings and you know, the high and the kind of trash and everything, and just put a few shiny buildings in the front. Uh, and yeah, we should so that's that was just like I found out interesting some else I find that to be the the most like emotional part of the period of love. Uh, as for nostalgia, I'm uh, very anti nostalgia in general. I've been trying to construct my parents' nostalgia. So I ruined it every time they tell me, oh, it was a beautiful 60s. No, it wasn't. I uh, love articles showing them like uh, corruption in the real estate market in the 60s. Uh, uh, but just because, yeah. Um, but just because um, it makes it easier to animate, and the dream one is in capital of that, uh, he told me specifically what the my sister would have no roots anywhere. Thanks, uh, Dad. But, uh, but I know that like, he was like, you know, growing up here, but, uh, you know, growing up in London, I didn't want you to feel connected to this place that, you know, gave us no reason to believe in it, and I wanted you to be freer than you were, because we were always looking back to you, I didn't want you to have that. And now I find myself bringing back you know, pine nuts and zanda and the bottles of iron, and I kind of turn it to like a now. I bring my pantry with me from there, and it's clear it's, 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 it's to make fun of people who did this. And now I just really want to have this you know, cupboard that opens that has uh, bits of home, which are again constructed. Like, it's not that we had a home, you know, it's just something I've decided that's how I'm just staying attached. Uh, as for a future project, I mean, I still go to a lot of Day job, which is in the publishing. Actually, uh, we were basically right next to the head of which again, problematic is where the DD is the shadow of the building, but I insist on also the technology that we're next to the head of the which is the public position, but uh, if we're publishing it's also, it's uh, we're, it's not out there. But uh, so I go a lot, so we were told on my mind, I think I'm physically there. Uh, but yeah, probably the next thing I'm working on does involve. I uh, involve one of the epic, which is seems to be a theme for me. Uh, so yeah, so yeah, it's still there. I know we're talking a bit about future projects, but I'd love to um, put a quick on. And uh, I know that it's a like, passage to the field of flex, maybe we in some way, and if you could read that and explain why, that would be great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I. Um, I mean, Wapa is not set in Beirut. But I think there's def there are definitely elements of of Beirut that are in that are in Guam, um, or in the city that were Guam was sent. Um, yeah, so I'll read this and then maybe I'll explain why I read it. Uh, I don't know why 
the the city is in the grip in the grips of a heat wave, and we're all trapped inside the furnace. Some choose to ignore the flames, hiding within a mirage of air conditioned shopping malls, internationally certified hotels, expensive restaurants, and large plots of land awaiting construction. But if you're not careful, the overgrown pistol conceals burning ghosts that chase you through your past. These lucky few build wedding cakes and towers of glass, concrete, and steel to shelter them from the flames. Meanwhile, Inside imperial embassies protected by barbed wire and armed guards, fair skinned men and women in black jackets talk about fluctuating oil prices and counterinsurgency operations and stabilization projects and women's empowerment campaigns. And everyone is so self important, self deceiving, and self assured. For the young men who are driven out of the slums of Shabia in search of a piece of bread and some more, even if the work involves slipping someone's throat on a hunch that it might please God, Denial is a luxury they cannot afford. The city, ever so deceitful, lures these men deep into the desert in search of salvation, and then traps them in prisons to roast in the fire. The flames grip these young men by the throat, and as the last drop of moisture evaporates from their parched lips, there is only silence. But in the midst of this decaying, burning city, there are pockets of hope. It can be found in the tiny dark rooms and underground bars where women with short hair cheer on men in dresses. It can be felt in the abandoned cinemas where an honest strangers fall in love only for a few moments. And in the living rooms where families crowd around, drinking sweet black tea and spanking their homesick relatives, so that together they can watch the long ground and talk shows that go on all night. Despite the interrogation rooms, where men in uniform crack gloves and electric wires on the naked body of someone's son or daughter. Despite the prisons where men transform into sadistic pillars for a dream and paycheck, there are still pockets of hope in the streets of the city. Yeah, I think that's not good. Yeah. Great, it's interesting that you chose that because um, for me, I feel like Dubai walking in the garden, the car needs a little glass building, the glass sort of thing. So, but obviously, this is not set in a specific city. And uh, towards the end, I feel it's much more about the way you're just making a library on. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would agree with you. I think, um, I think that there's, you know, that, that reference, I think, what for me speaks to the sense of inequality that I think is increasingly prevalent in a city like Beirut. And I think it's a reflection of, of the, the growing inequality across the Middle East. But uh, I think I think it's something that I that I I've, I've been more aware of every time I go to the city. You know, the fact that um, there are no public beaches in Beirut anymore. The fact that space is increasingly privatized is increasingly being taken over by just a small group of people with a lot of money um, who, are, who are building these towers of glass. Uh, because there is there is definitely a lot of construction as well in Beirut. Um, so I think I think it does speak. To a part of Beirut in some way. Yeah, I mean, it's testament to the fact that you work well because I thought of many cities when I was reading that. So, yeah. yeah, that's great. I think maybe we can turn to politics a little bit now. Uh, obviously, in, in post war Beirut, during the civil war, and actually up until maybe 2006, I would say that Beirut was very much on, on the sort of Western imagination, in the Western imagination, because of all the coverage. And it was far more nuanced than because it was, you know, the city was being covered in multiple different ways. We weren't just covering the nightlife, which tends to be the one dimensional story now. Um, but there's a reason for that, obviously, and that's because of Syria and what's going on in the wider region. So maybe it tends to be kind of, I think, lower on the media agenda, far lower than it used to be. And my question for you is what do you think? The responsibility is for writers when we approach Beirut's sense, because Beirut is still very much weighed down by all the problems that you all touched on. What do you think the responsibility should be? Maybe just so we can start with you. Uh, well, I'm trying to just the gentleman right here, but uh, the gentleman right here, I don't know if you want to say that, but uh, uh, is there a responsibility? I don't know, I don't think so, because uh, Right, first of all, you write about what you care about. I tend to not like, I mean, from a personal perspective, the 
myself and the overarching narratives that are, uh, it's just like the, you know, it's, it's like the, what I'm calling it, it's like, you know, you have no responsibility to justify your, to, to expose your, you have no responsibility to, to your story, to um, your character story, whatever it is you're, you're discussing. And if people are curious about they would um, find what they need to find. And again, yeah, there is no one on paper. Uh, so, and you know what, like, uh, it, it's true that it's no longer on the, it's kind of one of those like, good problems, but you know, like, when we're not being talked about, I'm fine with that. Unless it's a garbage price. Unless it's a garbage price. Yeah, but actually, actually, but that's funny because now a lot of people come to me like, oh, you guys have that crush thing. Which um, has changed from my side of the novel. Yeah, I suppose responsibility is not the right word. Maybe it's a little more of a little bit of a right thing, right? Since this is about maybe it's. Uh, yeah, but there's, I mean, it's, there's a lot of. Um, Exceptionalism, when we talk about a lot of labor. I mean, every city is like London is one of like a uniform place. A lot of this, I'm sure there are contributing millions of experiences in London. Uh, just as there are millions of experiences in Peru, and if you can tell yours, your slice on the map, that's your role. Uh, I don't think that I have responsibility as a writer to uh, uh, now represent Beirut because Beirut is no longer in the headlines. I, I don't believe that. I think my only responsibility as a writer is to write well, to, uh, no, seriously, is to, so whatever I'm writing about is, is to, to write well and, and take my job seriously. And so if I happen to be writing about Beirut, uh, I have to write well Beirut and the audience, like what you guys were saying, but there's this, and also that, there's the boy dancing, and also that one, and, and show, show the details and sh show the idiosyncrasies and, uh, and, and tell the stories. Um, and, and I do believe that storytelling is powerful. Uh, I do believe in the power of storytelling. So if it happens that right now my story is about Beirut, just have to make sure that it's a really well made good story and build that bridge between me and the media. I do believe that writing is about building these bridges, and the only way you can do it is if you actually write well. Uh, yeah. Um, I think I think Beirut often gets miscategorized or often gets a very shallow recording, um, partly because it is a very charismatic. Very glamorous city. You know, it doesn't have the, the seriousness that Cairo has. It's it's got this very cosmopolitan air, uh, and I think you know, and, and, and it's it's very charming. So so as a visitor, you go to Beirut, and, and you you know, it's, it's it's like it's like a very charming one night stand. You know, yeah. um, and I think to write about Beirut, whether you're, you're from Beirut or not from Beirut, I think requires. Uh, Time spent a bit more really exploring the contradictions. You know, there there are so many uh, articles that, that talk about, uh, for example, the, the gay nightlife in Beirut, but they don't really understand the you know the the nuances of, of, of these things uh, that I think make, for example, the gay the gay scene in Beirut so so special. You know, so uh, I don't know what the word is to describe it. You know where. Um, there, I mean, the, the beauty of being able to, to kiss another Arab man, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a dance floor, but then also being very aware of all of these masculinity issues, all of these sectarian issues, the fact that, you know, when he takes you home to his Sunni parents and then they ask you what your name is and they find out what you're married at. You know, they're all kinds of, so I mean, I think, I think to, to write about, about Beirut is, is you need to go a bit deeper to really capture what is so special about Beirut. Yeah, that's great. Well, I hope you come back to Beirut in the future. You're right. Oh, am I writing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>